Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, the notorious RMB, and of course, Gilbert is here with me. Welcome to you, all the members of this, the post geek singularity community. Good to see you again today on a Wednesday. We are, of course, a day before the season finale of the second season of Star Trek Discovery, which is what I wanted to talk about today because I have a great letter that's going to lead into that. But before we get to this discussion, I have some other great letters. Again, one of the great things uh, about this post-geek singularity community that we've all been building here is you guys. And I love interacting with everyone. And the letters I get at my, my website, theburnetwork.net, please send me any letters that you want there. It's the best place to get me. They've been amazing. I, I've been blown away by the letters and the thoughtfulness. And so is Gilbert, as you can see. He's eating his giant bone I got him for Christmas that still exists, which is probably the only bone I've ever given Gilbert that still, in fact, exists. So there are a couple letters I wanted to read. One is from, from listener Joe Long, who's written me before. Um, I really like this letter, actually. It's, it's a short one. Uh, this is what Joe says. Hey, Rob, talking fandom and being part of your group. At first... I wasn't sure if I was going to watch your YouTube channel because of your love of Star Trek and Star Wars. The reason I say that is because, to me, those weren't what grabbed me when I was little, so I didn't think I could fit in with everyone else that followed you. But watching you talking on John's show about your love of comic book movies made me give it a try. And now, look at me now, <laughs> loving your show and being a member of the post-geek singularity. I remember growing up having Star Wars figures and not watching the movies in theaters. And with Star Trek, no one in my family watched it, so they didn't grab me like that. But I liked playing with my He-Man figures. But my true love grabbed me in 84 in the form of Transformers. And they really were the world to me. And it was what gave me a happy place during that time in my life. Then, as I grew older, it was superheroes that started molding me and my fandom. But don't get me wrong, I still love my Transformers. Many years later, I realized how your love as a kid fades, but the love of my life that I met in 1996 restarted my love of geekdom when she started buying me Transformers and going to all those superhero movies and supporting me and my loves because she loved me. Which in turn opened up the love she has for these things too. So back to what I was saying earlier is that my love may be different than yours, but now I feel a part of this fandom and I don't feel out of place, even though they're different than yours. You help show some people or people wherever you go that being different still works and everyone is welcome. And I would like to thank my wife, Kelly Long, zombie mom, for making me who I am today and for giving me and my girls, Sophie and Macy, and to you, Rob, for being you and being the engine leading the geekdom train. I'm here for the long haul your friend and fellow geek, and remember that someone somewhere is thinking of you so smile, Joe Long, zombie dad. Well, Joe sent me a lot of a little missives and, and letters, but I really, I really liked this in particular because it speaks to something that I think that I, I, I don't know if it's, if it's understood by a lot of people here as far as I'm concerned. I grew up loving most of this stuff. And while I predominantly might talk about Star Trek or comic book movies or James Bond or Star Wars or something like that. My interests are are far and wide. I'm I'm a huge I read a lot of books, I read a lot of nonfiction, I watch a lot of non-genre related movies. As a matter of fact, most of my favorite movies in life are not science fiction, fantasy, horror, or comic book related films. When it comes to Transformers, while Transformers are they sort of hit after me, and Transformers were really designed for the American toy network, and they started out as bastardizations and repackaging of Japanese toys. I grew up with a fierce love of Japanese super robots and then transforming robots, beginning with, say, well, Gundam mobile suits, which weren't really transforming. Some of them did, but but Gundam and then Robotech. Of course, the Veritech fighters transformed, but, you know, I love robots like Mazinger Z or Grandizer or uh, go, uh, Get a Robo G, Go to Guys Get a Robo G, which was actually a sequel to Get a Robo that I'd never seen. I saw Get a Robo G first in America and loved those. 
Of course, they were brought to America and repackaged as the Shogun Warriors, which was actually, I I believe in America, it was part of the Force 5 package. Star Avengers was actually Get a Robo G. So I love Japanese science fiction, giant robots and all that. And Transformers were great, but Transformers were something that was actually created for the American kids market. Uh, and so I never really got into it because I was a little older, but I do love transforming robots and I do love mecha of all kinds. Um, big fan of it all. But I, I just, you know, what I wanted to do is, is point out, and Joe pointed out, that anybody that has any kind of interest in science fiction, fantasy, or horror in any form is welcome here. We're here to discuss it all. I don't dislike any of it. And if someone is a huge fan of, say, Harry Potter, which I don't know much about because I was older, so I didn't get into reading all the books and I've seen the movies, but it's not, I'm not fiercely passionate about Harry Potter the way I am, say, about Lord of the Rings. That doesn't mean somebody who is fiercely passionate about Harry Potter is not welcome here because I always love hearing about other people's fandoms about things. It's like Norman Lau's letter yesterday when he talked about he'd never heard about UFO and he was prejudiced against Jerry Anderson Super Marionation shows. I mean, it's funny because when I first started, I saw Super Marionation for really the first time on Showtime in the early 80s when they had packaged episodes together as like movies. So that's how I first saw Stingray, for instance. I'd never seen Stingray. They even James Wan even referenced Stingray in the beginning of Aquaman. You see a, a clip from Stingray. That was, of course, Jerry Anderson's undersea super marionette show. And I had owned Thunderbirds when I was a kid because they were dinky toys, but I, I hadn't seen them yet. I didn't see them until later in life. And now, of course, I have the Blu-ray box set of all the original super marionette, the Thunderbird episodes that Jerry Anderson had done. And I, I just love it all. So it doesn't matter what your interest is. Uh, the more niche it is, the better. This place, observations, the post-geek singularity community, is a place where you can share it all. There, we we are not prejudiced about your your geeky interests here. I will I will I will make sure of that. So uh, I really appreciated your letter, Joe, and um, uh, I thought it was good. And I'm glad that you feel welcome, and, and I hope everybody does. This letter comes to me from Liam Kelly. Now, this is a, a long run on paragraphs. So I'll try and <laughs> do this right, Liam. I'll try and do right by you, sir. Hi, Rob. I'm sorry if this letter isn't constructed well, but I'll try my best to get the point across. So, I love comics. I love comic book movies, and I love comic book games, and so on, and so forth, and so forth. The only person who loves all of these things as much as I do, maybe even more than me, is my best friend. My best friend has played almost every comic book superhero video game and has watched every comic book superhero movie ever put on the big screen. And he, like me, is only 14 years old. <laughs> Recently, after seeing Captain Marvel, he has started to be obsessed with Marvel comics and Marvel movies. Around the same time, I started to become obsessed with DC comics and DC movies. During this time, I would read The Killing Joke daily. And that's hardcore. <laughs> and I, and it, that would make me happy for the whole day. Of course, these obsessions clashed. I would always talk about DC to him, and he would always talk about Marvel to me. He would come over to my house after school and just play the Iron Man 1966 TV series theme song in my house as loud as possible on my speakers. <laughs> and in retaliation, I would play the Batman 1989 theme as loud as possible on the speakers. This situation often led to us arguing for hours about which was better, Marvel or DC. The argument started innocently with arguments like who would win, Batman or Iron Man. These arguments soon turned personal and both of us would bring up ridiculous and horrible points about the opposite team. I would reference the, is that a personal attack or something? Comment that Brie Larson made in an interview mocking her and Captain Marvel. He would reference the infamous Martha scene from Batman v Superman and use it as proof that DC is bad. We rarely acted like friends anymore, and we always argued just because of this. After we saw Shazam together, my best friend turned to me and he smiled but didn't say anything. In that moment, it dawned on me. I realized that we were being idiotic. <laughs> my best friend had just enjoyed Shazam, but he didn't want to say it as he thought that would be him losing. It had turned into a war between us. Neither of us said anything, but we were both thinking it. When I arrived back at my house, I got a text from him. 
ranting about how terrible the whole Marvel versus DC thing is. For hours, I talked about how great I thought the MCU was and how great I thought Logan and Deadpool were. For hours, he talked about how great the Tim Burton Batman was and how much he loved the Dark Knight trilogy and how he wants to read Watchmen and how he wants to borrow my edition of The Killing Joke. For a while, he talked about how bad he thought Thor The Dark World was. And for a while, I talked about how bad I thought Suicide Squad was. By the way, you're right. Uh, it was one of the nicest moments of my small life thus far, and I will treasure it. <laughs> we both laughed at the comments we had made weeks before about Marvel and DC. We spoke about Star Wars, Aliens, and Predator 2. And I felt like, once again, we were truly best friends. It really taught me the lesson of how ugly someone can become if they let a little fun competition get to their head. My best friend had a similar experience with someone else once when he argued with them over which is better, Star Wars or Star Trek, and they ended up not talking to each other ever again. <laughs> I told him to watch you as your channel is so pure and it accepts all fandom and it is a place where everyone feels welcome. There's so many different types of fans who watch you. There are horror fans, sci-fi fans, comic book fans, etc. And you are a true inspiration to all of them. Thank you very much for taking the time to read my letter. I don't mind if you share it on video. Keep doing what you're doing, and I will certainly keep watching Liam Kelly. Well, I mean, what can you say? Liam, thank you so much for this letter, because if there's any reminder that I need, and sometimes, by the way, I do need reminders, <laughs> you know, as much as I can be smiling and be having fun all the time, there are times when I really want to punch somebody in the face and gouge my own eyes out with the teaspoon. <laughs> so anyway, this this letter was fantastic. And, you know, you reminded me back when I was when I was your age, I used to have knockdown drag out arguments with sometimes the older kids. They were total Marvel fans and I was the DC fanboy. I love Justice League of America. And, you know, I have these arguments. Silver Surfer is not more powerful than Superman. And people are like, yes, he is. He's the Herald of Galactus. Blah, 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 blah. We, 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 we too would become very vitriolic and angry and mad about our <laughs> about our interests. But here was the thing. I don't know when it happened. Somehow I picked up an X-Men comic. And I like I loved it, which led me to reading the Avengers. And I realized that my favorite superhero team went from Justice League when I was younger to becoming the new Teen Titans when I was a teenager and famously when I was becoming a teenager when I was young, 13, maybe 13, 14. And they did a, a crossover comic. I mean, I had already had this Spider-Man, Superman crossover comic in the, in the early, in the mid seventies, but this comic was dark side and dark Phoenix team up against the X-Men and the Teen Titans. It kicked ass. You know, and it was it was <clears throat> seeing two of my favorite super teams that my newly favorite super teams, both the X-Men and the Teen Titans, combined forces against two of the greatest villains in, in their pantheons, uh, made me realize that, you know what, it's all, you can enjoy all of these things at the same time. And then, of course, the comic book world led me to independent publishers. You know, I found one of my favorite comic books still to this day. American Flag was published by First Comics. They also published Grimjack and Star Slayer and um, uh, comics that I dearly loved, crazy comics like Mars. Then I found other, Kamiko published Grendel. You know, and 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 I, you know, the superhero genre is not just dependent upon DC and Marvel. There's there was lots of other great publishers. There's Image. There's Boom Studios. There's so much great stuff out there. What's really important is the comic book medium itself. And it's as diverse as any other kind of art form. There's not just superheroes. And I found all that as I grew older. I mean, I, I envy you because, first of all, thank you. It's nice to know someone who's younger watches this channel and gets something out of it. I don't have to feel like you know, I'm coughing up the dust of some crypt that I'm about to be lowered into. So thank you very much for that, Liam. And my advice to you is what's great is having fans and friends that like different things than you do. So you can, as you discovered, you can share your mutual love and hopefully he'll give you his favorite runs of Marvel comics and you'll turn around and give him your favorite runs of DC because what we really want are great stories. Well told. Stephen King once said that. Great stories, well told. And I want to thank you again for your letter and thank you for writing in. And uh, it's always nice to hear that we fans, no matter how old we are, we really haven't changed. <laughs> so again, Liam, thanks very much. And and I think, you know, you're just beginning your journey 
there's a there's a world out there full of wonderful wonderful treasures that you're going to find you're going to find old movies you're going to find new movies you're going to find things you haven't even considered yet once you start delving into novels i mean if i might recommend a great novel series if you like superheroes uh there's a book it's being turned into a tv series now but the novels are great the wild cards series and start with wild cards one uh it's a very interesting take on an alternate history and superheroes and supervillains so check that out thanks again for writing man it's 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 nice to know it's nice to know that the younger generation is actually watching this show. <laughs> now, this letter, which brings me to the topic of this conversation, Star Trek Discovery. Wow. Uh, people know that, that there are a few things in life that I have disliked more than Star Trek Discovery. I've never had a root canal, so I can't, I can't compare. But um, not a fan. And as a lifelong Star Trek fan, it gives me no pleasure to dislike something that is Star Trek. Uh, and I've had a problem with Star Trek for the last decade, since 2009 and J.J. Abrams' Star Trek movie, Star Trek 09, came out that everybody sort of universally loves. I do not. Um, it's fine. But uh, not a fan of where Star Trek has been taken. I don't think it's been well served. I don't think the... But anyway, <clears throat> there are others in the continuum that feel uh, like I do. And one of the voices of reason, somebody who's written a lot about Star Trek Discovery over the last couple of years, somebody that I've followed, somebody that I admire, somebody that I believe just wrote a very academic college paper on, on even Star Trek Axanar, <laughs> or as we now call it, Axanar, Star Trek fan film. Or really, I don't call it anything at all since I'm no longer associated with that project, but it'll always be a part of my life, whether it's in my imagination, or in the courts. <laughs> so, this letter comes from John Price. And I, I must say, John, thank you for writing this. Hi, RMB. I'm writing to you as a kind of confession couched in narcissism that perhaps may be of interest to you and or the rest of the post-geek singularity and shine a light onto the biggest issue facing nerd culture today. That is to say, I'd like to provide a glimpse into the mind and dispositions, the actions and justifications of what it means to be a toxic fan. This is a long one, so if you don't read on air, I totally understand. I just want to get it off my chest regardless. Oh no, John, I'm reading it. All of it. I should note up front that my version of toxicity is not one based on, uh, not one based in social bigotry. Those people aren't fans, they're assholes, pardon my language, and can and should be rejected, mocked, mocked, and marginalized as the broken souls they so clearly are. After all, as the man said, there's no room for bigotry on my bridge. That would be in Balance of Terror. No, my version of toxicity is that of a love gone wrong, a devotion betrayed, an identity rejected. To be cliche about it, I've loved Star Trek since I was a child. I'll save the sob story, but it, it brought me and my father closer together in a time when we were drifting apart. It gave me a moral compass, an ethical base, and a series of smart and strong role models in a time when religion was failing me, my voice was getting deeper, and I was being picked on for getting straight A's. Hashtag humblebrag. When other kids were indulging in the fads of the month, I went home and watched TNG and TOS reruns and allowed myself to be drawn into the future. Through the next generation in the original series, I developed my sense of self. I questioned how I'd respond to the dilemma of the week and if I had the strength to not kill the Gorn, despite, like most humans, having an instinctive revulsion to men in plastic lizard suits. I found out rather quickly math wasn't my strong suit so I'd never be an engineer, and my thick glasses ensured I'd never be Captain Christopher, discovering a starship in low orbit. So I read a lot, and I wrote a lot. I began to develop a skill for breaking down narrative structures and seeing the way themes are interwoven and characters were developed. In high school, I began to understand the Western canon more and how Star Trek, at its best, is Shakespeare in space. 
My formal education continued, and through my BA, MA, and now PhD, I've become pretty good at reading and deconstructing stories, whether they be fictional plots or the narratives we see on the news. This is not to brag or suggest others more skilled, but rather just to give you a frame of reference for my state of mind going into the 2010s. So the J.J. Trek movies happen, and you know what? I like the first one. It's dumb as hell, but the actors nailed their roles, and I actually like the visual aesthetics of the J.J.-verse. Smartly, J.J. created an alternate universe, which allowed people like me the opportunity to give them all the benefit of the doubt and see the reboot as respectful to real Star Trek. Sure, it was a cynical move, explicitly designed to quiet people like me, but hey, compared to what was on the horizon, the J.J. Trek movies were the height of verisimilitude. (laughs) I beg to differ. As part of their lawsuit against Axanar, CBS declared out of thin air that they were creating a new TV show. Finally, the details emerge. Brian Fuller's show running, awesome. Hannibal's great. The show's a prequel to Kirk. Wait, what? And the ship is the rejected Phase 2 design everyone hates and makes fun of. Actually, it's the rejected Planet of the Titans design uh, that was under the production design of uh, Ken Adam, and it was drawn by Ralph McQuarrie. Okay, still, new Star Trek is good. Then they hired the guy who wrote Into Darkness, a movie so utterly offensive to Star Trek that it was booed at Star Trek Las Vegas three months after release. Then they kicked out Brian Fuller. New EP Aaron Harberts went on the press circuit, and I feel bad for him here, but he would say things like, I wasn't hired to know Star Trek. Christ, okay, that's fine. He doesn't need to know Star Trek to write good stories. Then the CBS marketing people decided to say a bunch of ridiculous things, like Sonequa Martin-Green was the first black main character, and that Discovery would be the first series to deal with war. So, doing what I do... I took my keyboarding abilities to the internet and began to write posts on Medium, a glorified free blogging website. It was cathartic to type out all my issues with the new show, and I had a great time coming up with one-liners that made me laugh. Whatever I thought, nobody's going to read these anyway. Might as well make myself happy. Well, sure enough, people did start reading them. Apparently, my disgust with the interviews I was reading was shared with thousands of other people. My numbers went up, influential people, like yourself, began sharing them, and like clockwork, dozens of people began insulting me on Twitter. I'm a former football player, fraternity president, and all-around egotistical guy, so I'm not just going to take being insulted. I fought back. The more heated their insults, the more stinging my comebacks. The more they called me a hater, the more I called them ignorant. Ignorant. My dopamine was redlining for like two months before the show even aired. There was a sense of entitlement to it all. Star Trek is mine. I understand Star Trek better than they do. And I'm a better writer than they are. So who are they to question me? Unless you're Mike Kakuda, I don't care what moron123 thinks about Star Trek. And I certainly don't care what they think about me. Season one began and it was atrocious. I wrote as much. I enjoyed writing as much. I actually look forward to tearing apart new episodes and thinking of the most scathing puns I could. Some of my weekly reviews got even better numbers. The only incentive for me was to keep destroying the show. About halfway through season one, I wrote a kind of FU article that literally verbatim said people who like Star Trek Discovery are bad people. I meant it. I still do. It's a blatant money grab by CBS, and I think the coming streaming wars are going to be terrible for us all. I lost internet friends over that. People who had been indulging my complaints cut me loose. But it didn't matter. I still had my hits and likes and retweets to give me self-worth. I was not just hating the show. I was deconstructing it. I was pointing out the flaws and the ways in which the shows failed. That was my justification to myself. I wasn't just saying, oh my god, I hate Mikey Spock, she's a Mary Sue like some others were. No, I compared her characterization to Ro Laren and how the TNG writers and created characters, not costumes. For my efforts at bringing smarter critiques, I was put on the Twitter block list and regularly grouped into their hater discussions. I picked up followers and this weird side war of the larger Star Trek Discovery debate took place in my mentions every day for a few months. Random people I'll never meet 
would make personal insults because I'm not anonymous, like so many, which pissed me off. Random people I'll never meet would call me a bigot and then say they'll never read anything I write. Well, that's stupid. How do you know if I'm a bigot if you don't read what I write? So even when I attempted to reason and discuss Star Trek Discovery with them, it went nowhere. Fast forward to season two. CBS adopts a hashtag, hashtag countdown to 1701 and begins promoting the show as such. So I create a series of posts about Star Trek Discovery with that as a framing device. Turns out some random person came up with the hashtag and reported me for stealing her intellectual property. Can you steal a hashtag? <laughs> I mean, it's a hashtag, but okay. So I apologized and praised her creativity. She told me to fuck myself and block me. Where's my incentive to be nice in this story? Where's my incentive to be the bigger man? Every time I try and make peace or have a discussion, I'm not only rebuffed, I'm insulted. Okay, so I cut back on the Star Trek Discovery posts. I genuinely didn't really care about the show anymore at that point, but my Twitter friends did, and they're still arguing over this or that, and I get involved sometimes. The first episode airs, and it's basically a J.J. Trek movie. Yawn. And the second episode airs, yawn, something about a red angel and whatever. It's all just so boring. Anson Mount is great. The rest of them suck, rinse, repeat. So I basically stop writing about Star Trek Discovery. Maybe I'll write a review for the, no for the finale, you know, the one that Kurtzman promises will resolve two years worth of plot, character, and continuity problems in 45 minutes. Maybe. I don't know. I just don't care. No matter the level of discourse in which I engage, from flame wars to nuanced academic breakdowns, in the eyes of my enemies, I'm a toxic fan, and they're glad I've stopped caring. The most common response to my criticisms has always been, just don't watch and let us enjoy it. Well, no, that's an incredibly stupid response. First of all, you want Star Trek fans to not watch Star Trek? That's a moronic point of view to have. Second, this notion of let me enjoy things is straight out of kindergarten. One of the best parts of being a Star Trek fan was always the intellectual side and debating Star Trek with other Trekkies. It made you think. It made you question your point of view, your biases, and your predispositions. No, I'm not going to stop watching Star Trek just because they're incapable of writing smart, nuanced characters or plots. That's on them, not me. Or so I told myself. Only children call it STD, they would yell. The acronym is a perfect symbol of the complete shit, shit show behind the scenes. I would respond before they block me. And so it goes back and forth. There's no room for being civil anymore, and I'm not sure anyone actually, actually minds it. Excuse me. I guess I'll wrap this up now with a couple of concluding points. The first is that Star Trek used to be an intelligent franchise that did not speak down to its audiences, but rather made the audience rise up to its level. The invention of Technobabble wasn't just to add words to the page. It was to get the audience on board that these solutions weren't magic tricks. The crew had to think their way out of their problems. When Geordi would have to reroute secondary power through the isolinear grid coupled with the binary transporters in Jeffrey Tube 10A, Jeffrey's Tube 10B, <laughs> the audience learned to respect engineering, to respect the human mind, and to think, hey, if I study hard enough, Maybe I'll know what he's talking about someday. When xenoanthropologist Burnham solves the galaxy from imploding or whatever by doing a couple of lines of code and makes a face, the audience learns nothing. That's bad writing. Pointing out that it's bad writing is not being toxic. It's being a thinking viewer. Which brings me to my second concluding point. My name's John, and I'm a toxic fan. I don't want Discovery to be good. I want it to be off the air. I don't want people to enjoy it because they're enjoying a terrible product that actively degrades the franchise I love and is a part of my identity. There's no incentive at all for me to not be a toxic fan. What do I gain by not watching Star Trek Discovery and letting them enjoy it? If CBS sees the outrage blowback dying down, they'll conclude they're doing something right. They're not. It's not the job of fans to demand better of the things they love. Oh, is it not? Is it not the job of fans to demand better of the things that they love? Should fans not be pushing creators at all times? Doesn't the Trekkie community specifically have an obligation to hold producers accountable? We, they, saved the show in 1968, 
So is it partly not ours? I completely understand when you, RMB, say that you hope Star Trek Discovery brings in new fans who check out old Star Trek, and I wish that too, in a perfect world. But if they like Star Trek Discovery, they're not going to like Star Trek. I've seen in Star Trek Discovery Facebook groups where people spend entire threads mocking and ridiculing the original series. I don't want that to continue at all. So where does that leave us? Should we just fade away and allow the thing we love to be hijacked and run into the mountain by people who don't trust, who we don't trust, and who will spend all day insulting us? Or should we fight back and risk being called a hater for fighting the things we love? What is the difference between love and hate after all? I don't know. What I do know, that's John saying, I don't know. That's not me saying, I don't know, but I don't know either. What I do know is the toxicity in fandom is not limited to one side. It's an Ouroboros. It feeds off itself. The more clicks I get, the more toxic I get. The more insults I receive, the more insults I dish out. The more I try and protect my franchise, the more I get pushed away. If the only options are toxicity or apathy, is that really a choice? Thanks for reading, assuming you did. It's a bit long. And if you decide to show this to others, maybe my experiences can help others find their own place in the great geek civil wars, even if it's to tell me I'm wrong. It's okay, I've heard worse. P.S. Star Trek V, The Final Frontier is my favorite Star Trek movie. Why is Captain Kirk climbing the mountain? Because he's in love. Well, John, I have to say that I, first of all, let me stop and tell you the whole reason that I'm now here and the whole reason, that's not the whole reason, but one of the reasons I'm here is because this channel is now sponsored by Lucky Tiger Men's Grooming Products. Lucky Tiger is for men who deserve to look good and feel great. I want to thank them for their sponsorship, and as you all know, this is episode 96 of this live talk show, and I'm coming up to episode 100 that I'm going to try and make special because it's you guys who have made this channel flourish, so thank you for that, and I want to get Alan Murphy, their CEO, because I've never had a sponsor before, on this show and interview him, not unlike how I interviewed my mom. I think Alan Murphy and I are much probably closer in age, and he really knows nothing about me, and I've never met him face-to-face, but he's supporting this channel, and I'd love to talk to him about one of the things I want to know basically about my, my my sponsors is that Lucky Tiger was a brand that was founded in 1935 back in, I think, Kansas City. And it was founded by the Willy Wonka of sort of, he was a scientist and he was a barber. And he played with things and came up with, with the product. And as I've moved through their product line, just trying everything out because they sent me a, a big box of product, I really like it. You know, I, I like some things more than others, but man, I, I love their all over body wash, which I tried yesterday. It's delightful. It's got like cucumbers and coconuts and all this natural ingredients in it. So anyway, I'm a big fan of Lucky Tiger. I'm happy they sponsor me. You should go to getluckytiger.com. I particularly love the facial scrub and the full body wash if you like that sort of thing. Or you can go to clubluckytiger.com, which is uh, I'm going to be creating content for them that is unrelated to the geek sphere. So uh, I want to um, I wanted to thank them for that. And before I get into my thoughts about Mr. Price's letter, uh, the Babic asks any chance or any change. Well, I guess any chance you meant to say thanks for the support. By the way, any chance we'll get a new Superman? Any chance we'll get new Superman news anytime soon? Love your show, my friend. Well, thank you for the support. By the way, I would hope. I mean, we saw you know when I saw Superman, even though we didn't see his head but when superman appeared at the end of spoiler alert shazam i you know it made me realize i want i want another shazam movie you can't really see but you actually can here's russell crowe as jarell here's my my hot toys figure right there of russell crowe's jarell and i have my hot toys figure of marlon brando as jarell right next to him and i i i really like man of steel i would hope we get another superman movie soon He is the granddaddy of all superheroes, after all. I mean, I know people are going to be like, no, what about Gilgamesh? Hercules, I get it. But, I mean, the modern era of superheroes really began with Superman. He's sort of the... He's sort of the patient zero, as it were. Uh, Willow Yang would like that reference uh, of superheroes. <laughs> he's the vector which which we all were infected. Uh, but uh, I I really uh, I really enjoy Superman. I really like Man of Steel as a great first contact story. But anyway, I had to read John's letter because it is the day before the season finale of of Discovery, and I, I as the gatekeeper of verisimilitude. One of my biggest problems about Star Trek Discovery, 
uh, as a show, as a science fiction show, and as a Star Trek show, is I often talk about how I'm fond of verisimilitude, which is basically believability. I would define verisimilitude as the filmmakers or, or the, the showrunners make you believe, even though you're looking at something that's a complete flight of fancy, that really has nothing analogous in the real world, but they have created a universe, a world, a situation that we can believe in. And that verisimilitude extends throughout every part of whatever it is they're making. In movies and television, it means that the sets, the, the miniatures, the costumes, everything that you see on screen within the proscenium, if you want to use a theatrical term, a proscenium of that frame is believable. Now, when I was a child and I first came to Star Trek when I was five years old, for whatever reason, as a, as a child, sure, I'm sure the bright colors attracted me to it, but I believed it. Like, I, I completely was immersed. And when, when Star Trek did something like time travel, for instance, in, in Tomorrow is Yesterday, when the Enterprise uses is thrown back in time because they get too close to a black star, and then they 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 later they called it the light speed breakaway uh, effect. They later use that same technique that they had learned by accident in an episode called um, uh, Assignment Earth, which was the end of the second season of Star Trek, and it was actually a backdoor pilot for a show that was never made. But that method of time travel, which then again was later used in Star Trek for the, the the Voyage Home was based on scientific principles. Now, time travel is, of course, we haven't, doesn't exist. Um, but, but the way it was approached in Star Trek, they tied it to theories of relativity, the idea that there was some kind of science. Sure. Was it science fiction science? Yes. But I believed it. I believe that a ship traveling at warp speeds, traveling around a sun, creating some kind of gravimetric effect or whatever it was, the light speed breakaway factor could propel a ship backwards and forwards through time. I believe that because even as a kid, I'm like, oh, Einstein, you know, I remember trying to figure out what E equals MC squared meant. But even as a kid, I had a rudimentary understanding of, of basic, what, what that meant, especially if you liked space like I did and read encyclopedias like I did. And uh, E equals MC squared, kind of like pi. You kind of had to understand what was the, what was pi? What was 3.14, you know? As a kid, those were like the two things because, ooh, Einstein's theory of relativity. Because when I started reading science fiction, there was all kinds of mentions of the theory of relativity as regards to space travel. Because if you're traveling faster than the speed of light, does time slow down? All of those kinds of things. I mean, it was it was a part of science fiction. And if you start reading the canon, you start dealing with time travel, and you start dealing with space travel and, and reading stories about those things, how time travel in particular is presented is key because everyone who tells a time travel story, they have to establish the rules of what govern time travel. How does it work? You know, if you watch two of my favorite lower budget time travel movies that not a lot of people have seen are Primer. That's a mind bender. There's a movie that costs $30,000. And it's one of the most mind-bending time travel movies ever. And there's a Spanish film called Time Crimes that begins with a man sitting in his backyard. And those are two of my favorite time travel movies. More recent time travel movies that I really love, Predestination, which is based on a Robert Heinlein story called All You Zombies. If you haven't seen Predestination with Ethan Hawke, I, I recommend seeing it. It's, it's a fantastic movie. I really love it. And it's based on a Robert Heinlein short story, so what's not to love? But so, even in Star Trek, when they've dealt with, with time travel, I mean, we saw different kinds of time travel in All Our Yesterdays, the penultimate episode of Star Trek. We, we have the Atavacron. We have a time machine that sends the inhabitants of Sarpedon back into their own past to survive the star Beta Niobe going Nova, uh, which was interesting. But you had to be prepared to go back in time because you had to be prepared for the time you were going to live in. Your body had to be physically prepared. Very interesting. When the Atavacron was open, very interesting. Uh, City on the Edge of Forever. We had the Guardian of Forever. Uh, we have a machine that was built by an ancient civilization that could travel. You could travel through time by going through the time portal. But even the Guardian of Forever couldn't change the way it was made. There's that great moment. Can you affect the, the speed? Kirk asks, can you affect the speed by which 
the past travels by and guardian's like no i i can only do what i was paid to do <laughs> you know and 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 so and that was interesting and of course in deep space nine uh the prophets the wormhole aliens that exist outside of linear time which for anyone who's read science fiction not exactly a hard concept to grasp they had created an orb one of their orbs was the orb of time and we saw in trials and tribulations the wonderful uh, anniversary episode that was done in 1996 for the 30th anniversary of Star Trek. We saw we saw the crew of the uh, of the Defiant go back in time and meet with the crew of the original Starship Enterprise, and they combined using digital effects masterfully combining those things. So Star Trek and time travel have always gone together. First contact, of course, uh, we we saw there the, the board could travel through time. I mean. It got a little bit more ridiculous. Year of Hell, I particularly like the two-parter and Voyager. Time travel got to be sort of a crutch that Star Trek used. But never has the concept of time travel been so abused in Star Trek as it was in the second season of Star Trek Discovery. They apparently now have time crystals, which are, what, a naturally occurring substance? I mean, the monks on Boreth, the Klingon monastery, are overseeing those those time crystals there are time crystals there's not even any effort made to establish believability with their concept what with, with what discovery star trek has had time travel since the first season back in 1966 and they've always given us some kind of plausible believable reason or methodology for traveling through time verisimilitude existed i was convinced of the reasons for time travel to exist. When you create magical crystals like time crystals, and no, this is not like dilithium crystals that are used to power the mat matter, antimatter engines of the enterprise, because there's something analogous in that. We have been digging up fossil fuels our whole lives. It is believable that a diamond like crystal can be used to run power or energy through it. I mean, same thing with, with lightsabers. I believe in lightsabers because the kyber crystals that we've now seen in Rogue One. But we heard all about those crystals all the way back in the book Splinter of the Mind's Eye in 1978. But dilithium crystals have something that's analogous in the real world where we can go, okay, I believe that some kind of energy can trans can be transmuted or something or, or pushed through dilithium crystals. And I believe that. But when you create time crystals, you're creating this fantastical idea, which is time travel, and you're just making something up. There's, there's, not even a, there's not even a rudimentary link to something that's remotely believable. It becomes magic. And there's no more verisimilitude for me. And they, 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 have, hung, they have hung these I the ideas of time crystals. Everybody has them, you know? Uh, section 30, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. But when when they have those kinds of things, when the writers, this is the, the worst kind of science fiction writing, the worst. I mean, this is the kind of writing that would have been poo-pooed in the 1930s. You know, when Hugo Gernsback, uh, I believe the Hugo Award was named after him, even him, back in the golden age of science fiction, they would have come up with something that's even more plausible. H.G. Wells in The Time Machine had a machine you know, he maybe he didn't understand the actual mechanism of how it all worked, or maybe that, but who knows? Maybe he had some physics behind it. But that was more believable. Time crystals is the most lazy kind of science fiction writing. And when Star Trek, that from its very first season 53 years ago, tries to make a concept like time travel plausible, and tomorrow is yesterday, uh, you know, they don't even know what happened. They traveled through time, and it's a shock to them as much as it is to the audience. And, of course, they get discovered by a 20th century fighter jet, and Captain Christopher, as John Price referenced in his letter, uh, tries to identify the Enterprise, chase after it, and his plane disintegrates. And history could be changed. We even had a great time travel story in that, even though they played fast and loose with the ending. So for me, as a lifetime fan of Star Trek, when I see... Star Trek reduced to that kind of horrible writing. And not only that, but they hang their entire season on time travel and none of it makes any sense. It really is hard for me to stay a Star Trek fan. I mean, I, like John, 
I watch every episode of Star Trek. I do because it's Star Trek. It's been a lifelong thing. But I think that, unfortunately, what's happened with Star Trek, and this began with Star Trek 09, the writing, the, they, the, these people, the people that are writing, the writing staff of the show, they are not qualified to write good science fiction. And I, as somebody who's been a consumer of the great science fiction, the great canon of literary works, the great shows, I mean, don't get me wrong, I've loved horrible horrible shows in the past, horrible science fiction shows that I probably have no business watching. But I understand what they are on their level. I still get a kick out of watching Barbarella, maybe because of the Orgasmatron or knowing that that's where Duran Duran took their name from. I love Flash Gordon. It's silly, but I love Flash Gordon. I can take joy out of Flash Gordon. But no one ever tried combining ultimate stupidity with something that I, you know, loved. I mean, I love Star Crash. I talked about it yesterday. But, you know, Star Trek, Star Crash didn't all, all of a sudden become, no one told me that, uh-oh, but here it's supposed to be treated as, as great sci-fi. And I feel that all of Star Trek Discovery, from the interpersonal relationships that the characters have to the ridiculous idea of a spore drive, Star Trek Discovery has just piled one unbelievable uh, thing after another on a show that has no verisimilitude. It has no believability for me. And I cannot watch it. I cannot, I, I cannot watch it without getting angry. And I feel that I and the rest of the audience, like John Price does, are being insulted. And when there is so much great television writing, whether whatever you want to call it, whether it's Game of Thrones, whether it's Breaking Bad, whether it's Ozark, whether it's the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, there's just so much great television writing. You would think that they would find writers for Star Trek Discovery that are, for instance, aficionados of science fiction, that are well-versed in the canon. So they're not coming up with ridiculously stupid ideas like time crystals and using them willy-nilly however they want. I mean, there's more believability when I read about the Legion of Superheroes flight ring and the way the Legion of Superheroes flight ring has been treated over the last 50 years of Legion of Superhero comics. And, and it, it, it's, it's because the writing staff, the people that are writing are like, time crystals, yeah, we can make it up. They feel that they can do this to Star Trek. And that's what really pisses me off about it. Now, I don't mind that people like Star Trek Discovery but what I've said before on this show is that when we get things like Star Trek Discovery, it diminishes it diminishes science fiction in the continuum of, of our world now. Bad science fiction is bad for everyone. Now, I'm not taking away from the fact that people can like shows. That's fine. But bad science fiction leads people to think poorly. They, they, bad storytelling does the same thing. You know, great storytelling elevates all of us. If you read a great story, like Stephen King said, a great story well told, it enhances your life. It also enhances the lives of everyone else who's read that story. Great stories usually demand something of the audience, first and foremost, that they think. You know, reading science fiction, reading bad science fiction diminishes the genre as a whole. And what John was saying about Star Trek, this is the kind of show, Star Trek Discovery is the kind of show people used to make fun of the original series for being. Um, people would laugh at the Gorn, even though that episode is incredibly, uh, in terms of where it goes and where it winds up, asks some very interesting questions. Now, everything you see on Star Trek Discovery, it's window dressing. It's all window dressing. None of it is truly earned. They add all this stuff. The fact that they think, oh, Michael Burnham, that you've got so much diversity in Star Trek. And, oh, we've never dealt with war before. Oh, we've never dealt with people that are not the same on the outside as they are on the inside. I mean, all of this has been done and infinitely better in the first 40 years of Star Trek than it has been with Star Trek Discovery. Star Trek Discovery also, and I think one of the things that I really hate about it is I've read all of the original story outlines that Brian Fuller was going to attack and what, what they were originally going to do. There was no spore drive. All of that was about terraforming. And it was all based in real science. The whole idea about Stamets, Stamets, his name comes from a real scientist, a real scientist that deals with mushrooms. 
that deals with the fungi and the, the networks that they create. And it was fascinating. And the way it was originally applied to the original conception of Star Trek Discovery was fascinating. It all had its basis in science. And it was all really, really interesting. And then to see that concept bastardized into a spore drive that like there's there's a fungi network there's there's uh, or in the universe somehow i mean and then oh and then people live in it and oh we can bring people back from the dead i mean none of this makes any sense it's all weird fantasy magic and that's why i hate star trek discovery so much i hate it because it diminishes what star trek is as a brand it diminishes ultimately the people that watch the show you can take in, enjoyment out of it and I, I, there are people that can watch it for for what it is, but to me, it was like watching the Dukes of Hazard when I was a kid. I, I there are a lot of people that like Dukes of Hazard, and I think that certainly it was entertaining. I couldn't watch the show because I thought it was brain dead. I'm like, I want more for my entertainment. I want my entertainment to to enrich and challenge my life. And I feel that Star Trek Discovery has always diminished it, and it's not. I don't like not liking Star Trek Discovery. I tune into every episode and I hope that it's going to be better. But their depiction of Section 31, this intelligence agency, as they've depicted it in this episode or, or in this season, compared to how it was originally conceived in Deep Space Nine, I mean, Section 31, all of Section 31, all it was was basically one guy. One guy who mysteriously showed up Dr. Bashir would wake up and there was Sloan sitting in his room. And you know, through the portrayal of one man, even the clothes he wore, the actor they chose, Bill Sadler, who I had the joy of working with on the Hills Run Red back in 19, or 2008 in Bulgaria, that was clever. This entire clandestine super secret organization was represented by the comings and goings of one man. Now Section 31 it's got a whole sprawling, it's got a headquarters where everyone knows where it is. It is the dumbest. They've taken what was a really cool idea, which, by the way, has been developed in a series of Star Trek novels in a much better way than it was. Uh, by the way, anybody who likes Star Trek Discovery, I would like to point to the David Mack Star Trek novel Control about Section 31. Hmm, Control about Section 31. It's unbelievable. But anyway... I like John's letter, you know, we're at the end of season two of Star Trek Discovery. And another thing that's egregious, is there anything, when Star Trek The Next Generation, when it was conceived, they made a conscious effort other than to have DeForest Kelly play Admiral McCoy in the pilot in Counter Farpoint to, to distance themselves from classic Star Trek because they wanted to create their own identity. That was a big deal. And even in the third season episode where they brought back Sarek, Yes, Sarek of Vulcan. Not Sarek, but Sarek of Vulcan. When they brought Mark Leonard back to play Sarek, it was a wonderful story about Alzheimer's. It was an Alzheimer's allegory, and it was wonderful. And there was one mention that Ira Bear fought tooth and nail against Rick Berman to get. One mention of the name Spock in the episode. Star Trek Discovery has done everything it can to strip mine the original series. Uh, whether it's Telosians, whether it's Captain Pike, whether it's Sarek and Amanda, whether it's now Spock, they have not forged their own identity. The first season didn't work, and I was really excited. I mean, what more about Star Trek do we need than Star Trek creating its own new identity? Uh, that's what we want. Or show the kind of fealty that we saw. If you guys haven't looked at the new Mandalorian trailer, not the not the behind the scenes trailer that you can find online, but the actual scene from The Mandalorian that has Werner Herzog in it and Carl Weathers in it. There is more fealty to the Star Trek universe in that clip than we saw in two seasons of Star Trek Discovery. And the thing is, if you're going to go back and avail yourself of these characters, of these characters that have been around for a long time, you got to do better than, than what they were already as depicted. You know, Look at the end of Star Trek IV, not even my favorite Star Trek movie, but the scene between Spock and Sarek at the end of that movie has more heart, more emotion, and better writing than in two seasons of, of the depiction of Sarek in, in, in Discovery. Now, again, there are going to be people that are like, well, I like Star Trek Discovery. You're welcome to like Star Trek Discovery. But I will say right now, I will say right now that Discovery 
is not going to make you smarter. And Star Trek used to make you smarter. I mean, it was something that, that and John Price eloquently puts points that out. Star Trek was something that challenged you. Discovery is something that is not challenging. It's following the footsteps of all the myriad things it's been ripping off. And that's why I hate the show so much. And again, I don't want to begrudge anyone who likes Star Trek Discovery. It's going to be a lot of people have never seen Star Trek. They don't know. And it bums me out that they're going to watch Star Trek Discovery and then they're going to go back and they're going to diminish. See, the problem that I have with diminishing the past is you're not allowing yourself to see the progression of where things came to. And I do think that Star Trek Discovery uh, is a show that once they got rid of the original showrunner and they decided not to revamp it and start from scratch. See, even Gilbert Gilbert uh, knows. He feels my pain. He's been sitting here because he can feel how upset I get whenever I start talking about Star Trek. It's just... It's true. You know, when I was at WonderCon um, this this past couple weeks ago, I found an artist, Gilbert, buddy. I found an artist that that painted these minimalist pictures of starships. And I I just, I had to have it. I think I've shown this before, but I bought this from him. By the way, this is unlicensed Star Trek merchandise. But I saw this painting that he did. It's just a print of his painting. He did one. He did a one of the SDF one from Robotech. He did a two thousand one. He did an Eagle from Space nineteen ninety nine, and I looked at this, and I just I looked at this image, and it just gave me such joy. This image gave me more joy than two seasons of Star Trek Discovery, which have now cost in excess of two hundred and fifty million dollars. Probably, have we got two hundred and fifty million dollars worth of enjoyment from Star Trek Discovery? I don't know, but I know that there's going to be people that are going to be like, you're a hater. We don't like you, you know, whatever it is. I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of people that are, that are angry with me, <laughs> but I had to say it. I had to get on and, and, uh, this will, this will probably be the last thing I talk about as far as Star Trek discovery is concerned, <laughs> but, um, there are other people out there that feel the way I do. And I hope um, I really hope the show gets better in its third season. I really hope for the Picard show that it isn't just an amalgamation of everything else that's cool these days, whether it's Star Trek, uh, uh, Star, uh, whether it's uh, Guardians of the Galaxy or Star Wars or whatever. I mean, if anything should have been uh, a thoughtful, I would love to have seen a thoughtful existential, this is us version of Star Trek with the Picard show, but it looks like they're turning it into more brain dead, uh, ADD, uh, non Trek. I mean, you've got Picard at the end of his life. I mean, I, I wanted to see the state, the sailor who fell from grace with the sea. Not that that's the greatest movie in the world, but something like that, you know, rather than, yeah, they're going to make it zip bing pow. I'm sure, but it could have been an epic, thoughtful, I don't know what, but I, I don't think that that's what we're going to get. Even though hope springs eternal, folks, and I would love to see Captain Picard come back and have it be great, but I would like to see it be worthy of the name Star Trek and not just another version of something we are seeing elsewhere. So anyway, uh, that's that's. Uh, I'll go back and, and look and see what people are saying. I don't think I've missed any uh, Super Chats. I've only seen one, so I'm just going to start answering questions and see what you guys have to say. Um, yeah, but that's what it's all about for me, man. Uh, and thank you for John's letter. <laughs> Thanks for all your letters. And if you want to continue to write me letters after this, please do so at theburnetwork.net. You know, it gives me no pleasure to dislike something. I, I tend to like everything. I'm, I'm pretty excited about everything most of the time, whether it's, you know, Hobbs and Shaw, even though Justice for Han is not going to be served. I try to get myself excited about everything, but but I have found Discovery to be so egregiously lacking in anything worthy of the name Star Trek. And it's too bad because they certainly have the production staff. They have uh, they have the talent behind the camera. But I don't think the desire is there. You need people that understand what Ryan Coogler showed the Rocky franchise in Creed. You need something like that with what they've tried to do with the Star Wars franchise, honoring what came before. You know, the Millennium Falcon is still the Millennium Falcon, even though it's 40 years old. How come people think the Enterprise is so old? You know, you could use all the, it, it's all in how you shoot something. 
I'm not saying you have to make something look exactly like it looked in the 60s, but let me tell you, as somebody who was actually going to shoot on a bridge that was redolent of the 60s, it's all about the lighting and how you shoot it. Uh, it really is. Noel Ryan says, Star Trek, to me, used to be about hope and just the positive outlook on the future. I just don't get any of that from Discovery. There's nothing positive in Discovery. If they're not killing people, if they're not talking about crazy AIs, if they're not, you know, what, what's really interesting is if you go back to the original series, and there were many crazy AIs on Star Trek. One of them, of course, uh, in the ultimate computer, the, the M5 computer that is it basically a sentient self-aware computer or whatever, maybe, maybe not quite the AI that we're going to see in Discovery, but the sad part about it is they used the idea of AI to, to look into the foibles of, of ambition. And, and Dr. Richard Datestrom used his own engrams and, and used them in the M5 computer, which ultimately led to uh, its mistakes and its downfall. And, and the whole idea, this AI that we have, this control that we're seeing, is just a mustache twirling villain. There's no subtlety there. There's there's no commentary on on what uh, an AI could potentially mean for humanity. There's none of that. Even the idea of the Borg, when you saw the Borg, which by the way, Discovery ripped that off too. But when you saw Captain Picard being transformed in the best of both worlds, it was horrifying. You literally were seeing how awful it would be to have your humanity stripped away from you. Now that was established in Star Trek over a quarter century ago. And we're getting a, an AI, this whole, literally, you mean after Skynet, after Terminator from 84, after the Borg in 80, 89, I mean, this is what you're giving us? This is what Star Trek has become, rehashing old science fiction tropes again and again and again. What Star Trek used to do is take non-science fiction tropes, like, say, submarine warfare, and then apply it in a science fiction action adventure context, like in Balance of Terror, and then examine within that context things like bigotry and racism and responsibility, the captain's responsibility, and great, great stuff. Now we're reduced to basically Saturday morning television level of, of science fiction. It's really, it's really sad, and it makes me mad. <laughs> um, Bozo the Clown says, Rob, serious question. What you have done uh, for Star Trek 09, what would you have done for Star Trek 09 and Disco? I'd have made Star Trek 09 sent 20 years after Star Trek 6 with Nimoy back as Spock, but Pine and Company as new characters on the Enterprise B or C with Discovery just set post-Voyager. Look, I, I, I agree. I don't understand why Star Trek for 40 years, even Enterprise, while it was a prequel show, showed us an era we'd never seen before in Star Trek and did try, especially in the fourth season, Add to the canon. That's part of Star Trek's enduring appeal. I mean, part of my fandom as a child was growing up and getting the technical manuals and reading. I cannot stress enough, if you're an original series fan, go pick up the old Best of Trek anthologies. These were anthologies with people that were doing deep dives into various aspects of Star Trek and trying to reconcile the inconsistencies and make them all work. And I loved those things. I mean, and that's as a kid, I'm like, paging through all the stuff and in my own mind trying to figure out how does this work and if where did the United Space Probe Agency become the United Federation of Planets or are they the same thing? Who knows? I don't know. You know, what does that mean? But but that was the fun part. And, and now, you know, I don't care about holographic. Here's the thing. If you want to use holographic technology on a modern show, that's fine. That does not bother me. Because in my mind, it's like Star Trek did have holographic technology. They just didn't use it. They didn't use it for ship-to-ship -ship communications or who, who knows what they didn't. But in Next Generation, you'd see holograms and they would have, I know it was 100 years later, but, but that kind of stuff doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me at all. Uh, but the problem is Star Trek has become a period piece for a future that doesn't exist. And there's nothing wrong. If I was going to go back and make a World War II movie and I was going to show Sherman Tanks, for instance, you got to show Sherman Tanks. You know, you're not going to have F-16 screaming through the skies over, say, Normandy when, when D-Day comes. If you make a World War II movie, as I've said, you look at World War II movies of the 60s, just look at the lighting in World War II movies of the 60s. Look at something like Where Eagles Dare, which is a favorite World War II movie of mine. Look at how those movies are lit, and now look at how Saving Private Ryan is lit. Same war, decades apart. It's all in the filmmaking. You know, they they went and they had to change everything, which which in my mind and say it's canonical. Or now that oh wait, 
they're going to change it because of their ridiculous time travel. But okay. Um, anyway, uh, you know, I could go on and on and on and on and on. But part of the reason that I read science fiction and fantasy is because of the verisimilitude that these fantastical worlds are given. Look at how much time J.R.R. Tolkien spent building up Middle Earth. Read the Silmarillion. There was so much time and care put into these things. Read Mark Cushman's books about the development of Star Trek. These are the voyages. He goes season by season. Read the kind of conversations they had. Heck, watch my documentaries on the making of Star Trek The Next Generation that are on those Blu-rays that Roger Lay, Roger Lay Jr. and I produced. I mean, if you read any great science fiction that you love, whether it's Stephen R. Donaldson's The Thomas, the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, The Unbeliever, if you read The Hunger Games, if you read what J.K. Rowling did in the world of Harry Potter, how much these worlds, these fictional worlds are thought through and how much time is spent. James Herbert's Dune, one of my favorite science fiction books, read that book. The world building in it is incredible. There is no world building in Star Trek Discovery. It's all just done willy-nilly made up in the writer's room. I just, I can't stand it. As a lifelong science fiction fan, I really feel insulted by the show. It is insulting to me. Everything is a trope. And I see a guy like Anson Mount doing a terrific job as Pike. They've never even done an episode which shows, say, Pike dealing with a command issue that's deeply personal to him. It's all been this big, sprawling plot, 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 plot ridiculousness and and there's been no human story there's been no moment that you saw like you go back and you watch the cage you see dr boyce fixing a martini for pike and they're talking about what life is like you know pike people have died on rigel and he doesn't know about the the, the, the burden of command is weighing heavy on him it's just two guys in a room having a drink together and you know talking about human issues star trek discovery is not good at that uh, let's see. Willow Yang says she's got to go. Hope to see you all again soon. I'm sorry, Willow. I hope I didn't bum everybody out. Normally I'm Mr. Positivity, but you know, once, once, once I, I gotta get, I gotta get, <laughs> I gotta get it out sometimes. MW77 says discovery is awful. We'll al always have TOS and TNG and DS9. And you know what? There's a lot of Voyager you can go back and watch and it's pretty good. Norman Lau says, this is why I've fallen in love with Space 1999 so far in season one. My interest is so cemented in the sheer quality of the storytelling and so consistent in its finish, vision. It's incredible. Season one of Space 1999 is that way. And Norman, look at that. I've got a 148th scale Eagle Transporter right there. And uh, I have an unbuilt one that's right there, which I'm going to build because uh, that's a rescue eagle. And uh, yeah, but I, I agree. And consistency of vision is where it's at. And, and uh, you know, again, Star Trek Discovery was a bastardization of, of the original showrunner's vision that has been further bastardized by a rotating bunch of writers that are less and less qualified to be writing science fiction. At least that's the way I see it. Uh, <laughs> and I might continue to go. David Cabrera is here. Um, Rob, new low for the chat today. Just, uh, just just ready through racism, sexism, toxic fandom, the negativity seep right through, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does, you know, but but uh, that's why I chose to to do this on the, I, I read uh, the letter, but, you know, I disagree with you. I disagree with you. Racism, sexism, toxic fandom, John wrote about, and he wrote about why he was a toxic fan, and I understand that. And the reason I chose to read his letter was because I thought it applied to other people too. But like John pointed out, I don't think being, you know, being racist and being sexist is one thing. I think that's a, a different issue than demanding quality storytelling. I don't dislike Star Trek Discovery because it focuses on a woman of color. Star Trek is always focused on minorities. There's always been minority characters. And you know what they've done? They've never made an issue of it. If you go back and you look at the original series, uh, William Marshall, who played Dr. Daystrom in The Ultimate Computer, was black. And he was shown as being one of the greatest scientific minds of the Federation. No one ever, no one ever even said he was black. They just cast a black actor in that role, one of the smartest guys in the Federation. And, and Star Trek has always done that. It's always been matter of fact. Yes, when they first cast uh, Cisco, when they first cast a black actor to play the role of, of Benjamin Cisco, the first black lead in a Star Trek series, they touted that a lot. Sure. And he had he was a single father 
with a son. And I've often said that one of the greatest depictions of a single father and his relationship with a son was on Star Trek <clears throat> Deep Space Nine, much, <coughs> much less a black father and son, <coughs> which they they never <coughs> had to have some water, which they never really made a big deal of. And, and in fact, Cisco's race was never a part of the show at all, which is why it was such a great depiction. Then when we saw, when they actually went back and talked about Far Beyond the Stars or did that episode and they, they addressed racism head on, it was incredible. Star Trek has always been forward thinking, but they never touted the fact that, look, look at our diversity. I mean, that was, Star Trek began social justice warriorism without having to say that that's what it was doing. Gene Roddenberry was very smart and sly by until they did an episode like Let That Be Your Last Battlefield, but that was a Fred Freiberger produced episode. And certainly, you know, sexism, there was always strong female characters <clears throat> on Star Trek. Even the women that Kirk was interested in the original series, they were lawyers and they were scientists. And they were not, these were not your typical uh, um, love interests that you saw on TV. Even Star Trek II, Carol Marcus. I mean, you know, sure, you had an episode like Gamesters of Triskelion with a drill thrall and bread and circuses where a slave girl, Drusilla, threw him a few curves. But, you know, that was that was in the course of, of the storytelling. But I but I think, you know, when you say that 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 it's not, I don't think it's wrong. I don't think it's being toxic to address toxic fandom. I liked what John Price was saying. I thought it illuminated the subject matter in a in a in a worthwhile way. I think it was it's important to talk about these things. And I never think it's it's I don't think it's toxic when you're demanding better from things. You know, Star Trek has been great and it will be great again. But I do think over the last 10 years, there's a, this idea that Star Trek should be turned into something else, that what it was was is sort of archaic. No, what Star Trek should be, it should be the finest example of science fiction on television. That's what it should be. And it should not be pandering to old science fiction tropes. And it certainly should not be pandering. Like, look, if you want to show a single sex, a same sex relationship on TV, and especially in Star Trek, Star Trek should have the best same sex relationship on TV. It should have the most realistic depiction and it should be par for the course. It shouldn't stop and the camera shouldn't, they shouldn't shoot these scenes like, look, here are our gay characters. Here's how woke we are. No, you show characters, you show a, a, a real, you show these characters like working together. You show these characters in a, in a, in a relationship where the, the, their relationship is matter of fact. That's how you do great science fiction. It's, it's funny because, you know, there is a lot of really interesting science fiction novels, especially that go all the way back to things like The Left Hand of Darkness that deals with gender. Look at uh, an Enterprise episode like I always talk about, Cogenitor, an episode that talks about three genders. That's an amazing episode of Star Trek. And it talks about, I mean, what how they present the third gender and how the third gender is used is, is, is incredible. These have already happened on Star Trek. They've already been done. They've been done well. And when I can complain about something I love not being as good, again, I'm doing it on this episode specifically. It's not like I always rant and rave, although I do rant and rave about Discovery a lot. I think it's important that we have these kinds of discussions. And I think it's important, more importantly, that this, the post-geek singularity, this place is a place where we can come and have spirited debate that's respectful, that is mindful of the fact that people don't always agree with me. And look, I've talked to people that like Star Trek Discovery, but ultimately a lot of the people that like Star Trek Discovery are overlooking certain things. They're giving things a pass. I've never given Star Trek a pass. I mean, I've now go back and read what I used to write about Voyager. I wrote a, a, an article about how much I hated Star Trek First Contact. I wrote an article with my friend Dave Hargrove called Worst Contact. Why Star Trek First Contract is the worst Star Trek movie. I did. I wrote that article. Now, I, I was upset by it because I thought that in Star Trek, between q -Who, The Best of Both Worlds 1 and 2, um, I, Borg, and even to a certain extent, Descent, 
they said they were far more sophisticated in dealing with the Borg than what we got in First Contact. First Contact was a dumbed down action adventure movie using the Borg. And, and it was ham-fistedly written. And while I thought it was nicely directed by Frakes, uh, there was a lot of things in that movie that made my gums bleed. And I wrote about it, passionately wrote about it. You know, and at the same time, I was writing about it while I was working on the Star Trek experience, the $80 million themed attraction, which I was hired to work on after being a Star Trek consultant. I worked for I worked for Viacom licensing. I actually worked at Paramount as a Star Trek consultant talking about what was good Star Trek and what wasn't good Star Trek. Boy, I would love to have had that job over the last 10 years, let me tell you. So look, while I these 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 chats are, are positive, and one of the things I'm selling is positivity, which is absolutely true. However, I thought it would be interesting this time to talk about Star Trek Discovery and what we all thought about it. But you're right. The point is well taken, David, now that I keep talking about this. Um, I, I wouldn't call this a low for the chat today. Um, I was reading a letter that I got from a viewer, John Price. I've loved his writing about Star Trek Discovery. And I think his letter in the context of this, the post-geek singularity community, is absolutely uh, relevant to read. You know, especially after getting two letters which talk about how people feel a sense of, of belonging here. And, and the problem that I have is that I have talked about and debated Star Trek for a very long time, 50 years. And probably not 45 years. Let's say 45 years. Um, and that's, I've always had spirited debates with people. It's only recently that these debates spiral into, well, fuck you. I don't understand that. I mean, science fiction fans have been debating the merits of their favorite stuff since I've been going to conventions. I mean, that's one of the things that was great reading letter columns and comic books and going to conventions. When I was a kid, I went just cause I couldn't talk to anybody about Star Trek. I mean, I did have those debates like Liam talked about. I had debates about what's better, the Justice League or the Avengers, and we would get knocked down. Well, not quite for fights, but it's been a staple of science fiction for a long time, but ultimately, you use all. You used to always be able to come back and be friends. What I find interesting now is there people will not engage in, in cogent, rational debate, and that's what I miss. I mean, I like talking about Star Trek stuff. I like having debates, but you know, people are like, well, I like Star Trek Discovery, and I'm like, really? You know why do you like it? well because I do. Okay, well, that's that's fair. I can't I can't take that away from you. Uh, it's good to it's good to like things. I, I think it is. And if you do love Star Trek Discovery and it's the first Star Trek you've ever seen, you wouldn't know the difference. And you're going to try and go back and watch the original series, and you're not going to be able to because just like I've talked to my friends or I've talked to people many times, I've said if you grew up in a world where Jurassic Park already exists, it's going to be very difficult to go back and say watch. The original Godzilla or watch the beast from 20,000 fathoms or something that was animated by Ray Harryhausen. It's tough. It's tough to go back to that time when you've already been given, when you've already driven a Lamborghini, it's hard to go back and own a, a you know, a sensible economy car. <laughs> I get it. Uh, Noel Ryan says, I love my old Trek, but as Mr. Spock himself said, change is the essential process of all existence. Look, I agree with that. I agree with that, but we live in a golden age of television. You know, I go back and I watch The Expanse, which is based on a series of novels. And The Expanse, that's some compelling science fiction. It's got your over the top with the proto matter stuff. It's got the pseudo science, you know, science fiction always has its weird pseudo science, but it's, it, it has verisimilitude. I believe in it. So, I, you know, I think uh, it's, it's something to, to discuss, but I want to be able to. I want to be able to, to have these kinds of spirited debates, but in a respectful manner, in a place where everyone feels welcome. And as I've said, there are people that have come to Star Trek Discovery for the very first time. They don't know anything about Star Trek, and they're captivated, and I understand that. And I think more power to those people. But even then, I think that the storytelling on Discovery does its audience a disservice because it should be smarter. That doesn't mean, look, I like a lot of things that aren't smart. But Star Trek should be smarter and it should be better because we deserve it. And the times we live in, we live in a time where we live in a science fiction world. Why do we have to see such black and white portrayals of what AI can be? Look at a movie like Her. You want to do a story about an AI, a malevolent AI even? Why are we seeing the most basic, perfunctory, ridiculous notion of what an AI is? That takes me all the way back to the 50s. I mean, 
show me what a what an interesting 21st century version of a self-aware AI is that, oh no, this AI just wants to wipe out all sentient life. Why? What is the AI's philosophy? Why is it drawn that conclusion? Simply because they needed a villain? Star Trek was never about bad guys. Star Trek was always about antagonists. And those antagonists might have been on a different side of an issue, but they were never such black and white villains. This is something that's come about and it's it's not the way to go. It's not the way to tell a good science fiction story. And I don't think that um, I don't think that that's wrong to point out or to feel that way. And that's why I want to talk about it here. Uh, Clinging Mars says the Daystrom Institute is referenced in future series. Yes, it is. I mean, the Daystrom Richard Daystrom is a revered voice in the Federation. He created the Duotronic Circuit. After all, not that anybody who works on Star Trek Discovery would know that. Uh, Alexander Wilson says, Sophie Turner said that the hatred she received from Game of Thrones fans almost drove her to suicide as a little girl. Hatred can lead to that, so be careful. Listen, I, I want to be clear. I don't dislike people. You know, everyone, they're all trying to get paid. Everyone's trying to do their job to the best of their ability. Star Trek Discovery was compromised from the get-go. It's been compromised this season by the shift in the firing of showrunners, they spend too much money. There's been great tumult between the scenes. But you know, I'd like to see I'd like to see the hires for this show. Michael Shaban for the uh or Shaban uh is a really interesting choice for the Picard series. I'm hoping that um that it turns out great. I really do. But I'd like to see, you know, authors and writers that that have a, a distinct voice and understand not everybody can write good science fiction. You know, speculative, great speculative science fiction is difficult to write. That's why for a long time it had no respect. You know, there was a lot of people that didn't that didn't believe in the genre. Um, so yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, Norman Lau says the issue with Discovery is that it's trying to be radically new and trying not to offend the existing canon. And the original series canon is the most sacred upon which Discovery is treading, which is affecting the story. That's actually very astute. I mean, they've gone back to trying. They're they're they're, they're strip mining. First of all, you have to understand whether you like the original series or not. That's what Star Trek is. That's the original. That's the template. That's what the whole essence of what Star Trek is is the original series, and they've gone back and they've tried to change it, which doesn't seem uh, at all a good idea. <laughs> you know, it's you're never going to win. You're never going to win because your ideas. Are are you're, you're assuming that your ideas now are 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 better than than the ideas of a, of a generation that came out of World War II, than a generation of people that were pretty highly educated that had a lot more life experience than you who are writing the show now are have, and it, it, it's just a different time. So the idea to go back and 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 strip mine what was already been done, the classic, the actual prototype for what Star Trek is, seems not the best plan, and that's all I've been doing for the last ten years. Jennifer Jones is here. Mugen Double Eight says, met Melody Anderson too. They both signed my VHS, but Sam Jones stayed till he met everyone. You might dig the doc, Life After Flash. It is great. I can't wait. And Big Chief Studios is finally doing six scale Flash Gordon figures, and their, their figures look great. The Ming is amazing. Bartomac is here from Ireland. Trek fans have always pointed out canon problems in other Trek shows. Discovery just happens to have the most canon and story problems. No Trek fan wants to dislike it. We've truck, we've loved Trek our whole lives. Absolutely, sir. Bartomac, I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, you're absolutely right about that. Absolutely right. David Cabrera says, Mike Bodden, so far in the chat, we've had toxic fandom, racism, sexism. Wow, this is a new low for observations. Again, now you've said it twice. How is that a low? I don't think it's wrong that we can talk about these issues. I, th I think that, you know, my chat, this is the, the 96th chat, and why not direct? The, these issues were brought up by a, a, a watcher of the show, uh, John Price, who's somebody who's, who's writing I respect. But I don't think it's wrong that we address these issues. They're out in fandom. I don't consider myself a toxic fan. I don't. I think my, my uh, idea of what Star Trek Discovery is, might consider or might seem to be toxic to people that like it, but I'll sit here and I'll have a very quiet, reasoned debate. That's why I wanted to bring up the issue of time crystals in relation to science fiction as a whole. 
you know, when you're bringing up these kinds of ideas, when you're bringing up science fiction concepts, the whole idea is to give them verisimilitude. That's what the great science fiction writers have always done. Make you believe. They make you believe in time travel as a concept. And when we've lived in a world where we literally, all the way back to H.G. Wells, all the way back to Mark Twain even, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court. We've we've had time travel stories for years, and in science fiction, some of time travel, some stories, some time travel stories are the most beloved. I mean, you think up, look at Back to the Future. Back to the Future is a phenomenal story about time travel, and they give us, you know, a DeLorean. You you have to have a certain uh, uh, amount of matter that you have to use, you have to have nuclear power, you have to have go to a certain speed, and you have to have certain whatever. But you believe it. They, they spend enough time developing that there's science behind it. You built a time machine out of a DeLorean? You know, there's, there's all of this stuff. There's enough in the storytelling that you go, okay, this is a big ask, but I believe it. The movie makes me believe in their time travel. When you say there are time crystals, that is the most that is the most lazy, as far as science fiction concern is concerned, no science fiction writer worth their salt would do anything like that and expect you to believe in it. And, and that's what my problem is. That's not good writing. If you want, if you want to, t- it, and also somebody has been in their, their time, their time suit for how long, how much air do they have? You know, where have they been going? It's yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. Josh Peterson says, I get the complaints about disco. I feel a lot of old school Trek fans are just dissecting the hell out of it more than any other Star Trek show. It's science fiction and fantasy. But Josh, great science fiction and fantasy makes you believe. That's what it does. It makes you believe. And the people that traditionally love science fiction, fantasy, and horror as a genre, especially as a literary genre. Remember, science fiction first and foremost came out of literature. Same with horror, same with fantasy. These are, are are literary genres, which means they they they're erudite. They're they were originally written by by great writers, great thinkers. Well, maybe not all the time, but 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 there was thought put into them. And and if you're a fan of the genre, if you come out of a literary background, which I think anybody who really likes science fiction, fantasy, and horror, you have to at some point have picked up a, a book in your life and you realize how well developed these concepts are. And to watch a show like Star Trek, which again should be the Tiffany standard of great science fiction on television. It really should be. We should be seeing, if you want to tackle issues of diversity and sexuality and racism and, and religion and gender, all of those things, do it in a really great, smart way. Don't do it in the most perfunctory, easy way possible. Give us something great because the audience deserves it. And so does so does the world at large. You know, when you're not telling good stories, it diminishes storytelling continu- it diminishes storytelling as a whole. The continuum of storytelling is diminished. I really believe that, especially when you you have so many great there's so many great Star Trek novels, there's even great Star Trek comics. There's so many great Star Trek ideas out there. That when you're making a television show, the the flagship of Star Trek, you should be giving us the very best Star Trek, especially with the kind of budget they've got. Really, spend less money on your special effects and your sets. How big and how, how, how polished do you have to make those floors after every take? I don't care. Nobody cares about that stuff. When it comes to Star Trek, you can put two people in a room like Dr. Boyce and Captain Pike in the cage or in the menagerie. And that's a great Star Trek scene. There's a great Star Trek scene where McCoy is in a doorway and Kirk's leaning against a wall in Balance of Terror. And Kirk says, why me? Why me? And McCoy says, you know, that great speech, I can only paraphrase it, but when he says, you know, in this galaxy, there's one million million type Earth type planets and one million million galaxies or whatever. And in all of that, and perhaps more, only one of each of us, don't destroy the one named Kirk. I mean, come on. It's two men. There's barely even any camera movement in there. And that that's a great Star Trek scene. And this idea that you have to turn Star Trek into something it's not is, it's a fallacy. It's just, it doesn't work that way. Uh, Joseph Herrera says, I think there is a measure of cathedrals in these discussions when they are constructive like this and well-reasoned. Well, I appreciate that. I like to think so. I, I Look, I don't 
feel I went to the Evergreen State College where you didn't get grades. Before I moved to USC, I went to the Evergreen State College. You had seminars where you had to do the reading, you'd have to read the book, and you literally went in with students, it was probably 15 in a class, and the professor. And for hours at a time, you would seminar. You literally would discuss what you read, led by, the discussion was led by the professor. And I was in a program my first year there called The Making of Meaning. And, and we had really intelligent, really interesting discussions. You'd have a three-hour discussion before lunch. You'd go to lunch and have a three-hour discussion after lunch. They were very enriching. And you, you had to learn how to converse with people. And you had to learn how to convey your ideas. That's why what happened on the campus in 19 or 2017 shocked me so much. And to see how, how it was depressing. Look into what happened at Evergreen in, in 2017. And I feel that's happened across the board uh, at, at our culture, in our culture. And it's it's a bummer. It bums me out. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, Barbecue Network says, Rob, will you make a Star Trek fan film instead of blathering on about Star Trek Discovery so much? I think you can put your time and energy into a more productive use by building something. Well, uh, no, I'm, I'm making a feature film right now. As a matter of fact, Right before I went on this chat, I received the first color pass by my color timer for Tango Shalom. I watched the first reel. I'm going to go back and watch the other uh, three reels that were sent to me and make notes. I have no interest in making a Star Trek fan film ever again. I was involved with that. I'd been there, done that. Very proud of the Star Trek fan film Prelude to Axanar. I suggest you all go check it out. But I, I've done my bit for King and uh, and Star Trek. And... and I spent three years creating documentaries for The Next Generation where I interviewed everyone from Rick Berman on down uh, about the creation of Star Trek The Next Generation. For three years, I did that. For three years, my job was to figure out how is Star Trek made. And uh, you can see the results of that on the Star Trek Blu-ray. So I would like to think that I have a little bit more unique insight than most. Uh, some people, like Mark Altman, have covered Star Trek even more, my Inglorious Trexpert even more than I have. By the way, this is a good time to plug the Inglorious Trexperts podcast. We have many folks that actually worked on Star Trek, and it has a sister podcast, Disco Nights, that talks all about Discovery. So if you like Discovery, let me let me send you on over to Disco Nights, hosted by Chase Masterson, Lita the Dabo Girl herself. Uh, Mark C. says, to the chat, please watch Morgan Freeman's 60 Minutes discussion on race. While I am believed a toxic racist, he believes what I believe. That's interesting. I, I did see that. It actually is quite good. Um, here's the problem. Here's when, when it comes to, since you brought it up, I think, you know, when we are discussing racism, if you haven't been on the receiving end of racism it's truly difficult to understand uh, to understand it holistically. That's what I've always I thought. I've often said that, like, for instance, in this country, African Americans, Black Americans have never, ever achieved true equality. Never. They're, they're, they never have. And uh, the, I don't know if they ever will, frankly, uh, especially with the, the numbers in the population. Less than 14% of the population of the United States are Black Americans. But you can talk all you want about laws that have been passed, and you can talk all you want about emancipation proclamations and everything, but any black American will tell you that they there's always been a moment where someone's looked askance at them. They've had long lingering glances in a, say, a 7-Eleven when they just stopped to get a candy bar late at night going home. Um, it's difficult to discuss racism if you haven't really understood it. Like I, I, when I went to South Korea last year, I was in South Korea for 10 days working on a documentary, and it was the first time in my life, because I had only ever really traveled to Western countries, even though I've been to Israel. For the most part, I'd only been to Western countries. I'd never been to an Asian country before. And I walked around where we were in Seoul a lot. It was fun. I didn't want to sleep. I didn't want to miss anything. It was so amazing. But even everywhere I went, I was keenly aware of the fact that I was out. <laughs> everywhere I went, there was there's not a whole lot of uh, non-Korean people in South Korea where I was. Um, it was actually shocking when we went to the military bases there. Suddenly it's like, wait a minute, we're not in Korea anymore. But it was very, really the first time that I, 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 I got a sense of what it's like. You know, you walk into a store, people look at you. They're like wondering, like, what's going on? And this, by the way, is a natural condition of humanity. I think we're genetically hardwired to be this way. But 
you know, it's very difficult. You have to be very mindful when you have discussions about race. As a white man, I can intellectually understand what it's like to perhaps be different, but I can't understand what it's like to walk into a 7-Eleven. I never once in my life have ever thought twice about going into a convenience store at night and buying whatever the hell I wanted to buy. No one's ever going to look at me twice, you know? Um, and uh, that's not true of, of other people, not just, not just black Americans or people from all over the world. It's anybody who's different, wherever you are on the planet, wherever you're, if you're the majority of, of people on the planet, you get to control what's going on. But I'll tell you, when you go somewhere where you're not, and there are places on this planet where everybody is, is, is a minority somewhere, depending on where you go, things are different. And until you've experienced that, it's really difficult to have those conversations with people because you're, you're speaking about uh, an intellectual concept without practicality. And, and human beings, you know, we have to, we have to always have to deal with both the, I think the, the intellectual nature of things, but then also the practical realities of, of a situation. Uh, and, and those things, I mean, too often we forget about the practical, the day-to-day -day realities that people face, especially when having these great ethical discussions or discussions about race and gender and, and, and things like that. And uh, we have to mix both the ideolo ideological with the practical. And I think a lot of the time we don't. And uh, I think it's important that, that, that we do. And, and if we don't, it's always, remember, like I always say, and I really mean this, you know, when I end this, these chats by saying every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear, all you have to do is listen. I honestly believe that because everybody's experience of the world is different. And until you, until you actually sit down and, and to, let, let's bring it back home, everybody's experience watching Star Trek and especially Star Trek Discovery is different. And, and I have to be mindful of that. I can't expect people that are watching Star Trek Discovery now to have watched 55 or 53 years of Star Trek history. I can't. What do I tell people all the time? If you grow up in a, in a world where Jurassic Park exists, you can't go back and watch Valley of the Guanji and take it seriously. You've seen photorealistic dinosaurs. Stop motion dinosaurs are never going to look right to you. If you're a character, if you're a kid or you're a person who grew up and didn't see much of yourself or people that look like you on TV, then seeing representation like whether it's Black Panther or a movie like Crazy Rich Agents or something like that, like it means something that I'll never understand to people uh, that are finally seeing themselves represented on screen, writ large on the big screen for the first time. I'll never know what that means, but I can understand that they understand or they're seeing something for the first time. And I have to understand that that's what's important. You know, I have to be mindful of that. We always have to be mindful of there's always another side to every story. There always is. There's always, what did Robert Evans, I think, the, the great producer, Robert Evans once said, uh, he said that, uh, I think he's, this is not a very good Robert Evans, but it's kind of good. Uh, he said that uh, he's, the, there's one story and there's another, someone has one story and someone has another story and somewhere in between lies the truth. I don't know if he said that. Maybe that's a bad Robert Evans impression. <laughs> Charlie Bluthorn. You got to read. If, if you guys want to read one of the greatest things ever, not read, but get the actual audiobook of The Kid Stays in the Picture. It's Robert Evans' account of Hollywood, and he tells it. And he's got this voice. I mean, it sounds like he had too much cocaine in the 80s or whatever, but it's awesome. You've got to get it. It's essential listening. So check it out. It's really, really good. Uh, Pleasant Valley Picker Canada says, um, discussing the flaws in something and wanting it to improve is not toxic. I agree. I think so. Greg Smith says, toxic fans aren't fans. Putting your toxicity first ahead of your fandom just makes you toxic. Critical fans are fans with discernment. You know, here's the thing, too. Here's what I'd love to say about that. I love people, all kinds of people. And storytelling, what is storytelling? In my mind, storytelling is is it's the way that we try and make sense of human existence in the context of these stories. We try and imbue all stories, whether they're science fiction, whether they're romance stories, whether they're tragedies, whether they're epic poems, whatever. Writers are trying to infuse these stories with the truth of the human experience. You know, the best stories speak to us on a very gut level. I mean, we, we sort of, I think we have a subconscious understanding. We all live in the physical world. So we have a, a mutual understanding of, of what it's like. We're all ultimately in this together. 
And what I love about fandom and what I love about the post geek singularity community is that ultimately our baseline is that we're all here together on this planet trying to get through our lives. We don't have a lot of time here. And then we find the same, we gravitate, we are a community that likes science fiction, fantasy, and horror because it speaks to us. But I think we don't just love science fiction, fantasy, and horror. I think you and I, and you and I, like me, like you, you, you out there, you, you and I, we all love a certain thing. And that is great storytelling. I think we'll all sit still. We don't just need science fiction. We don't just need fantasy. We don't just need horror. We don't just need superheroes. We need great stories. And we'll listen to and experience great stories no matter where we find them. I think all of us uh, have that in common. I want to believe that we do. And, and if that's our baseline, and if we come up with a baseline that you, you, when you talk to people and you think about it, you know, I read this article yesterday. I should find, I don't know where it was. I, I, I don't think I tweeted it. Maybe I tweeted it about how empathy is is gone now. We've somehow, we've lost the ability to be empathic or, or empathy towards other people. And I, 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 to me, how can you not be empathetic toward other people and still love storytelling? Because the great stories are after all about us. So I would like to think that, that this, you guys, the Post Geek Singularity community, you are empathic. You are, you love great stories. You love flights of fancy because ultimately all of these stories that we love are pretty much in the long run about how ultimately being alive and connecting with other fellow beings is a good thing. That's what storytelling is really all about. You know, we love the Jedi. We love Star Wars movies because somewhere we want to believe that we could all be Jedi or we could all be Han Solo or we all could be, well, I don't know maybe not Anakin, but, you know, we all want to be heroes in our own lives or, or at least heroes to other people or, or heroes to our children or heroes to our spouses or, or significant others. You know, that's ultimately what all of this is all about. That's why I love it. You know, that's why I think it's great. That's why I love this stuff. And I want Star Trek to, to do that as well. It certainly did for me growing up, but Star Trek Discovery is certainly full of a lot of death and destruction. There, there is not a lot of, 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 of great thinking about the morality and, and possibilities inherent in the human condition in that show, because it's trying to be something other than Star Trek. It's emulating different things than it should be. Clinging Mars says, I am miserable watching Star Trek and disliking it. It sucks. Me too, man. Me too. Chris Douglas says, Manifest Season 2. Yes, I agree with you. They don't know what happened to that plane, and the finale was bad, but I'm excited for Season 2. Love from Scotland, Rob. For those of you who don't know, Chris knows. Thank you for that, Chris. Uh, love from Scotland right back to you. Uh, Chris is right. I watch Manifest. And if you guys didn't watch Manifest, Manifest is a show. Here's the premise. A plane coming back from Bermuda, uh, going back to New York, passed through a time warp. And it landed five years after it left. And then the people who are on the plane suddenly are having these visions on how to help other people. <laughs> That's really what it's about. And everybody's trying to make sense of it. It's completely nonsensical and ridiculous. And it got the last episode got even more nonsensical and ridiculous at the end. And it was apparent to me, I was intrigued by the premise. I'm like, oh, they must have a they must have a reason for this. And they must they don't have a reason. They didn't know. Somebody sold that premise. <laughs> You know, and they didn't figure out what it was. They just kept adding to this mythology. You know, it's 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 a perfect it's a perfect horrible post lost show. And I like the cast. I like everybody in the show. I do, but it's terrible. It's a terrible show. It's a terrible fantasy show. It's it's just not good at all. And I hate watch it. And I watched every episode. And when I saw what happened in the end of the last episode, which I won't ruin for you, I just was like, I I'm like. F the show, <laughs> but I watched it, but it, it was on the bubble and it got renewed this week. So good on them. I'm happy people have jobs, which I truly am, but figure out what your show's about. That would be great if you did. Cause I'd, I'd like that. <laughs> um, Jim Boyers says a rational person can hate something, but still understand. And did I read that Jim and still understand and respect why someone else likes it? Absolutely. I, I, I agree that I, I I do agree with that. You know, if I wasn't a Star Trek fan and I turned on Star Trek Discovery, I'd probably be ensorcelled by it. Um, 
H uh, God for the win says sci-fi snobbery. Jesus, we get it. You don't like the show. Stop watching it. Laugh out loud. So I don't think it's snobbery. I, I I don't think it's snobbery. I think by definition, science fiction is a very erudite sort of genre. It demands a lot. Good science fiction demands a lot from its readers. I think good Star Trek does too. It demands from a lot from its viewers. Um. 666 says, I don't always agree with everyone's opinion, but I will always listen to them. I agree too. Look, I've learned more from people that I disagree with than people that I agree with. I mean, well, maybe that's not true, but but I, finding out, look, when you are talking with somebody that you don't agree with or you're listening to them talk about something that they that you guys don't see eye to eye on, you, you learn from them. You Learning their point of view is really important. I mean, I think one of the reasons that things are so divisive in this country now is that no one's listening to each other i mean we're all what happened to the fact that we're all americans and we all believe in truth justice in the american way you know we're, we're so angry with one another we've forgotten that we're all americans and um that's kind of a bummer uh uh chris douglas says can i send an off-topic message uh, i read your message i love that you did please there are no there's nothing off topic here <laughs> everyone's like <laughs> everyone's all being quiet like rob's on a rant I'm like no we we can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about <laughs> this is a long chat i've gone on and on and on um read by nature says i love mark twain time travel i i love the mark twain time travel tng episode uh, i remember being so impatient for the second part to debut the following week as a kid I know. Well, it didn't. You had to. You why you're impatient was because that Mark Twain twi time traveling episode, Times Arrow, was the end of the season, and to get to Times Arrow Part Two, you know that was the end of uh, that was the end of season five, and uh, the beginning of season six, and to get to that, you had to wait an entire summer, <laughs> which sucked. Um. Fenmore says, hey, Rob, I always thought the Enterprise's hologram concept was way too advanced in comparison to the original series and their alien adversaries. What do you think? Yeah, you know, to me, that kind of stuff doesn't matter because in a way, the, the case could be made like the Enterprise's main um, view screen in the original series could have been a holographic imaging system. We just didn't see it in 3D because of the way it was presented. But if they went and retconned that and you saw the view screen and they showed it as being a three-dimensional representation, that wouldn't have bothered me. See, that kind of stuff I think is 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 not that important. I can get past holographic technology. You know, it it doesn't, it doesn't, that that kind of thing doesn't bother me. It really doesn't. Um that I can get back. That that uh Mike Bond says, for everyone saying there are such thing as time crystals, I don't think the term means what it think you means. It thinks that, that, I don't think the term means what it think what you think it means. I can't speak. I've been speaking for too long. Oh, M Mas Hussein says the time ships by Stephen Baxter is an incredible sequel and an extrapolation of H.G. Wells' book and delves into the crystal um uh planarite. Yes, the the platerite, planarite, which powers the machine. Okay. Must thanks for bringing that up. If you guys want to read a great, truly mind-blowing book about time travel, Stephen Baxter is one of my favorite, I would say, hard, I would call him hard science fiction writers. Uh, I really love his work, uh, especially liked the Manifold series he did. But he wrote a sequel to H.G. Wells' Time Machine called The Time Ships. It's a big, sprawling, epic book. It is so much fun to read. Even if you haven't read The Time Machine, you've only seen the movie, it's okay. Mm, it's so good. So I got, have I had something on my teeth the whole time? That's just great. Good one, Rob. Um, I was eating nuts before this, almonds. So I apologize. The Time Ships, Stephen Baxter's Time Ship, Ships is so good. If you want to read a great book about time travel, that is a great book about time travel. And if you want to read, perhaps I dare say, my favorite book about time travel, which is unique, Ken Grimwood's Replay. If you want to read a great book, uh, one of my favorite science fiction books, it's kind of sappy and emotional, but uh, it's called Replay. It's by Ken Grimwood. Read it. Love it. They've been trying to make it into a movie for 25 years. I don't think they ever could, but it's great. Um, so yeah, writer B.L. Alley is here. Sanity is radical. Those theoretical time crystals have nothing to do with time travel. The Star Trek Discovery writers probably saw a headline and didn't bother to learn what they represent. <laughs> I would imagine that is true, BL. I would imagine that is true. 
Learning Disabled Spock says, one reason I love Dune so much is because Frank says, here's an issue now. Don't just accept my version. How do you feel about it? And how did you come to that position? I totally agree. Like all the great science fiction. You know, uh, I think it's great. Um, Patrick Glanville is here. Why did I buy Techno Babble in Star Trek The Next Generation, but in Star Trek Discovery, I just don't buy it? You know why? Because the story surrounding the Techno Babble you bought, whereas I don't think you're buying the story that Discovery is telling you. That could just be me. Uh, David Cabrera says, RMB, I bought Killer Joe. Thanks for the recommendation on the podcast. Have you watched it? I hope you got the uncut version. Yeah, tell me what you think. Now, that's a movie that's not for everyone, but man, what a fun movie that is. <laughs> Sanity's Radical says, best time travel story I've watched in years is the show Dark on Netflix. It's guaranteed to blow your mind. It is fantastic. I recommend everybody watch. It's a foreign show. It's German, right? Dark's German. I think it's German. Um. Dax Jacobson says, Star Trek Discovery lumps all the crap they have done together so they can bitch about people who bitch about it. Updating the look of the show is not the problem with the show. I agree. I really agree. It's one of the problems. It's a minor problem because I just don't, again, I don't think that there's any verisimilitude. No starship in space is going to have as much wasted space as the Discovery does. I even go back and I look at the original series and I'm like, the corridors in the Enterprise are too wide. I don't believe anything anything on these ships. When we saw the scene of the turbo lift going through like an elevator, uh, a roller coaster track, I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? What? what? They destroy verisimilitude on every level. Star Trek Discovery is a show with no verisimilitude. None. Zero verisimilitude. There's nothing about it that I find to have any believability at all. Nothing. True Believer says, hi, Rob. I can never understand racism, but I love comic book movies and cartoons. <laughs> yeah, I never understood. Man, I, like I've always said, my first crush was Lieutenant Uhura, and I, I wasn't really aware that she was black. Uh, she was just Lieutenant Uhura, and uh, she was so hot to me. I, I you know, and By the time I got to Mirror Mirror when I was a kid, I, she, she was the first woman I, I saw outside the beach with, with an exposed midriff, but that was clearly meant to be provocative, and for this young mind, it was... Mm, mm, mm. yeah i didn't understand racism as a matter of fact i was confused when i first was confronted with the idea that somebody didn't like somebody because they were black i'm like oh lieutenant uhura is black why wouldn't you like her i didn't get it <laughs> i didn't understand it was a very difficult concept for me to grasp um but anyway let's see uh bunyan snipe says just don't watch the adventures of mark twain animated film just don't creepy you know i feel i should give a shout out to terry flynn who's a longtime member of this the post geek singularity community you know uh i i feel like i haven't answered or i haven't <laughs> said anything to him so i just want to say hey terry what's up dude thanks for being here <laughs> um uh let's see koba's here Oh, I don't. Kobe said nitpicking nerd because he was returned. I don't know what you're referring to. Uh, uh, surf, uh, what is that? Surf Trektonic says Rogue One did not change all the ships. That's how you do a visual remake, not Star Trek Discovery post DS9 tech. Horrible. Yeah, see, I don't understand. It's so funny to me that there was such fealty to the designs and the aesthetic of the original Star Wars in as the Star Wars universe went forward. I'm like, you know, if you were to go back, and I know this firsthand. Because I was, I I even took a, I've shot on the original bridge up in Ticonderoga, that we tried to make look exactly like the original Star Trek. And when I had experience working on the Axonar feature film, my DP and I were talking about how are we going to shoot this bridge in a modern way. You could take the original series bridge and shoot it with different lighting and make it look modern. Um, you know, and do a few things. All you have to do is put animation on a lot of those screens and. You're off to the races. Um, let's see. There's been a lot of, you guys, a lot of interesting stuff here today. Bartomax says, Pike would recognize the engineering section, recognize the cadets, see the power build up. It went from being a sad set of circumstances to him being at fault in those injuries. Yeah. I I, I cannot tell you how much I hated that. Again, they, they even have to go and destroy what happens to Captain Pike. They have to make him not heroic. <laughs> Uh, John Benedict uh, or John D. Benedict says, I feel the same way about what's being done with Star Trek as with Star Wars. They should be moving forward instead of circling around the past over and over again. Be creative, not lazy. Look, after what I saw of The Mandalorian, I think, look what they're doing it right over there. 
they they they've made the familiar universe and they're going to tell all new stories and give us new characters and that's great uh terry flynn says as a white man i noticed that every seat was taken before anyone sat next to me in japan it was my first experience of reverse racism my best friend who was thoroughly nip nipponized nip nipponized explained it to me nippon meaning japan uh yeah come on come on terry you're a worthless gaijin you're a barbarian you're an outsider and it's 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 rough i mean i learned that tr it's true and isn't it interesting you you know you suddenly get a feeling of of just how different you are look who it is it's gilbert you want a cookie gilbert have i been talking too long gilbert wants my attention i have to go out and water our vegetable garden it's watering day today and uh i i've been neglecting gilbert i'm, I'm look gilbert uh, would you like to come up and say hello to everybody today come here come on up come on up come on there we go there we go all right buddy have a cookie right into the microphone i love that here do that again ready I love. I just love this sound so much. I mean, what more is there? Any more joy than that? Here, I'll give you a third one. Have one more, okay, buddy? Okay, that's good. Good for you, dude. I'll come out. We'll go water the garden together. I know you like to do that. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I just love when he eats these cookies. They make me. Uh, no, you can't have any more. You get three. That's what you get. Yeah. Right, buddy. You want to stay here? Well, anyway, everyone, uh, this was a this was a chat, a long chat. We're almost at two hours, but it was a lively chat. I hope you enjoyed it. I, I hope I didn't come off as being a toxic, sexist, you know, cis white male who oppresses all that come before him. Because I'm I'm not that way. I hope you don't think of me that way. But if you do, I'm willing to discuss it in a rational, cool manner. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank everybody for being part of this, the Post Geek Singularity community. What a terrific chat today. Uh, please like and subscribe to my channel if you if you want. I'm trying to build it up. And man, 97, 98, 99, 100. There are four live chats left until the 100th episode. I'm trying to figure out tomorrow is, of course, Thursday and Friday. Do I do two chats today? You know, I've been cutting down on the sauce, so no rip with Rob's. But, boy, I really need one, too. Um but anyway, uh, yeah, so we're coming up. I'm going to get, please write, remember, Lucky Tiger. Go to getluckytiger.com. Order something. Order that facial scrub. It's really good. I'm running out of mine. And uh, then write to Alan Murphy, the CEO of Lucky Tiger. First of all, thank him for sponsoring this channel, keeping me on the air. And second of all, tell him he should come on my 100th episode of Rob Observations. And uh, go to uh, clubluckytiger.com where I'll be creating content for them. There's some interesting stuff up already there too, actually. So check that out. Please keep those letters coming. If you want to write letters to me and you think I'm, uh, I am toxic and you do think I'm sexist and racist or whatever, I don't mind that. What I want is interesting discussion. If you write thoughtful letters, I promise I will look at all of them. I have a ton of letters, by the way. If you have written me a letter and I haven't gotten to it yet, that doesn't mean I won't. I reserve the right not to read every letter on the air, of course. Some things are not necessarily uh, pertinent to share with the rest of the community. But uh, if you want to take me to task, please do so. You don't just have to sing my praises. As a matter of fact, uh, if you want uh, to give me some healthy criticism, I'm happy to read that on the air if it's well composed and uh, well thought out. I have no problem. As, as Spock said, I have no ego to bruise, which isn't true. I do have an ego to bruise, but it's cool if I can say that Spock said something like that and pretend I have no ego to bruise, which, as we all know, I do. But anyway, I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you for being civil. I love this community that we're building. I love this, the Post Geek Singularity community. I love all of the support that I'm getting from all of you, and I hope you guys are getting support from one another because it's fantastic. I want to thank letter writers like Liam for writing to me. I can't believe I have a 14-year-old viewer, Liam. Thank you for that. You're giving me faith in the future, if not faith of the heart. <laughs> anyway, remember, every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear. All you have to do is listen. And with that, I bring this chat to an end. I will be back here tomorrow at noon. I will be on the John Campia Show tomorrow at 9 a.m. So, as always, have a better day and um, demand more from your science fiction. <laughs>